And the discussion for this evening is going to be Shikan on Zoom. And I, I just love this picture of the Shinto priest purifying the computers. <laughs> it seems like that's a logical thing for this evening. Um, you know, we've been replicating the in-person Wednesday evening service conducted by Tendai Buddhist Institute the last 26 years on Wednesday nights with the exception of the potluck. And there are differences in holding events in person compared to virtual meetings. And the discussions and the Dharma talk, for instance, may be more or less effective depending upon a given individual's perception. This evening's discussion is intended to make the experience more consequential. Additionally, even though the title is Shikan on Zoom, we're not really talking just about the mechanics of meditation, sitting, posture, and that sort of thing, though we will be talking about that. We're also talking about meditation, not as a discrete activity, separate and apart from the Buddhist path. Thus, this evening's discussion is aimed at the totality of the Wednesday evening gatherings on Zoom, though the emphasis will be on the meditation per se. And when we begin, what I'd like to do is begin by discussing some of the basics of sitting meditation. Uh, I've discussed this a number of times, and so people who've never seen it, it'll be uh, a, re a review and maybe, maybe new, and, but then most people who have seen it have probably forgotten it, so that it's useful in that context. Now, I want to just begin by saying that there's no magic to meditation. It seems magical when everything seems to be working as planned. When it seems like it's not working, then it can be frustrating. The important thing to remember, it's always working. The meditation is always working. What changes is what seems to work and what seems to not work. We're going to begin by looking at posture. And think of posture as the foundation of a building. If not correct, the building falls down. The steps are simple. The first is the spine must be in a straight line with the head and the coccyx. And you can see by the picture on the right, a monk who's sitting meditation. And you, that'll give you an idea of what straight means. Do not hyperextend the, the spine and don't slump. The chin is slightly tucked in, thus the cervical vertebrae is below the head and the head and the vertebrae in correct alignment. You can check this by lifting your head and shoulders and gently relaxing the shoulders again without slumping. Be sure you're not tilted front or back. Later, we'll be going through some of these again. The second is the breath. Ijishima Sensei hears this evening, and I can't tell you how many times he's spoken about the breath as the key to meditation and as the key to living. If the breath breathing is done properly, this by itself will calm and clear the mind. We usually do several exercises, one of several exercises before the meditation, and that's intended to uh, enhance the natural breathing during the meditation. We're, one is told to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. It varies. If you've got, if you've got um, uh, allergies, it may not work so well. The breathing should enter the body through the nasal passage, going down the front of the body to the tanden. That is the key, not the breath itself. The key, the, the key or referred to as qi in Chinese, is going down to the tanden, which is hara also in Japanese, tantien in Chinese, the sacral chakra in Ayurveda. The key mixes with the energy from the earth and goes back up through the center of the body, out the very top of the head, just in front of that slight depression everyone has on the crown of their skull. The breath itself, the wind, exits the mouth if possible. Again, if the body is not straight, the head drooped over, etc., the key is crimped and does not circulate properly. And this will lead to sleepiness, sleepiness and distracted thoughts. Posture and breath must be coordinated. They complement each other. 
And then there's the mind. Shikan, Tendai meditation, is concentration and contemplation, calming the mind, discerning the real, clear serenity, quiet insight. Those are all good terms for Shikan. Composed of two main elements, which have numerous ways of manifesting. The Shoshikan being presented by Ichishima Sensei will address this more thoroughly than I will at this time. The point I would like to make is that posture, breath, and mind are interdependent. We discuss them separately for heuristic purposes, but in fact, they should compose a single unit. And I'd like to present a perspective. The primary influences that condition meditation. And this is where my training as a biomedical anthropologist comes in. We begin with the set. The set is your expectations. Your meditation will be conditioned partly by your expectations. We may think, I'll never be able to enter, empty my mind. And you know what? You probably won't. You may have saw a film about people meditating, and that presents you with a certain set of expectations. Mm. Additionally, one's set changes over time. The experiences you have over time further condition the expectations. Hold on just a moment. Following this, we have the setting. Where and under what circumstances are you sitting meditation? In other words, it's going to be different if you're sitting in the temple and you've got a couple of dozen people around you and everyone is quiet and sitting meditation. There's a certain energy that is present as a result of all the people that are there. You may be sitting by yourself in front of a butsudan and you've lit a candle and you have um, some incense burning and that's going to present a different environment to, that will condition your meditation. Alternately, you might be sitting on a couch listening to new age music and that's gonna give you yet a different sort of meditation. This is your expectations. This is altered by our experiences as we continue to meditate. So what happens is whatever the meditation that you have may change over time, the experience of the meditation, because you are continually reconditioning the setting and how you respond to the setting. The third aspect I refer to as the agent. And this is the type of meditation itself. For instance, transcendental meditation specifically is intended to um, is specifically intended to bring one to the alpha state of neurobiology. Shikantaza, on the other hand, by Dogen, is a different agent. Just sit. And Soto Zen has a particular way of doing that. On the other hand, one may be attending a Tibetan empowerment, or one may be doing Shikan in a Tendai temple. Those are all different types of meditation. The set, the setting, and the agent taken together will result in very different experiences. I remember the first time I sat alone and I was uh, in high school and I'd been reading about meditation. I thought to myself, well, this really sounds like a great idea. So I was very, very careful to get some incense. It was probably something called jungle love or something like that. And I had a candle and I set it up in a darkened room and I sat there and I meditated for I don't, who knows how long, I certainly don't remember. Um, but at the same time, I remember thinking to myself, is that all there is? 
I don't get it. What's this thing about meditation? It's supposed to be so mind altering. Well, go forward a number of years to when I was in college and I met a Soto Zen monk who couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak Japanese, but I would meet him every morning around five o'clock and sit in meditation with him. Why? I don't really know. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Now, I couldn't really take instruction in meditation because he couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak Japanese, but I could follow what he was doing. And just by doing that, I realized that there was something more to this meditation stuff than I'd experienced a few years earlier while I was in high school. And so at that point, then I set out to actually investigate this in a more formal way and sat meditation with a number of different groups until I, I discovered what I needed to do. Um, taken together, the set, the setting, and the agent are not good or bad. They are what they are, and they will condition the meditation. The instruction that we're going to talk about tonight, tonight employs this particular perspective. And we're going to start with Shikan on Zoom, and we'll be talking about the set. I want you to stop and ask yourself, what are your expectations? When you, ex when you meditate, what types of meditation do you do? What are your experiences with Zoom? How does Zoom alter your meditations? What is it like to meditate on Zoom versus meditating someplace else? So what are your overall expectations? Living and traveling to Japan for almost 40 years, a major paradigm that I discovered was the distinction between East Asian and European perspectives in regard to how and why. In East Asia, how do I do something or how do I proceed? The intention is to do something as well as possible. From a European and an American point of view, the point of view is to ask why. Now, both how and why are important. And I think that many Asians can learn that it's necessary to ask why more often, while Euro-Americans need to ask how more often. Considering set, set, whether on Zoom or sitting in front of your butsudan, the operative phrase that we should be using is how, not why. <clears throat> when how enters into the thought process, excuse me, when why enters into the thought process, it can be just a curiosity, no big deal, but it can also be the ego asserting itself to question the legitimacy of what's being done in the sense of questioning one's own autonomy. And I will tell you right now that especially Americans are so different in this respect. When I was at Gyo in Japan, to begin with, you were never permitted to ask, why do I do something? You were permitted to ask, well, how do I do the following? And that's a natural consequence of that difference in paradigm. In the US and, and actually in Europe, when I've been there, the question always is, well, why? Why should I do it? Why am I doing this? Why is this important? Why not do this other thing? It's always why, it's almost never how. That's a really big difference. When why enters into the thought process, it really gets in the way of the meditation. How, on the other hand, can be very important to the meditation process and to the process overall. A major expectation should be that of encouraging diligence or virya. The set, that is to say what your expectations are, have the expectation of being diligent. Have the expectation of virya, forbearance. Let go of expectations as much as possible. 
Be present without projections of what you feel you need or what you want. So let go of the expectations. That's part of the process of better understanding set. When we deal with Shikan on Zoom, then we're also dealing with the setting. Each of our situations is a little bit different. Thus, conditions vary for each person. The following are not rules. They are guidelines which fit the situation we happen to be in. Additionally, some of these are under the rubric of Zoom etiquette and common sense. The first one is treat the virtual gathering like an in-person event. I don't have to tell you that when you're sitting home and especially if you're by yourself, you're in front of your computer, you feel like you're the only person there. But the fact of the matter is, that you're there with, let's say, two dozen other people. And those two dozen other people do see what you're doing. They hear what you're doing. They perceive things that you're not aware of. And the fact of the matter is that often we behave in a Zoom session in a way that we would never behave if we were with other people. For the meditation portion, I suggest reduce the lighting a bit, just as you would if you were in the hondo. Also, you might light a candle and burn incense. And just so that you know, lighting the candle represents purification. Burning the incense represents an offering. Use the same courtesy you would use for an in-person event. Don't get up and walk around during the meditation. That's very distracting to other people. Put your phone on airplane mode and do not have it near you, just as you would in the Hondo or a Zendo. We don't permit the telephone in a Hondo. Put it on airplane mode and put it in another room. Mute yourself. Keep the audio muted except when speaking. You might have a cup of tea beside you. You're picking the tea up. You might be stirring some sugar in it. That comes across on the the Zoom session. As a matter of fact, the way Zoom works, from my understanding, is that a noise, it doesn't have to be someone speaking. It can be the dog barking, will take precedence over somebody else that is speaking. or take precedence over what else is happening. So please mute yourself when you're not speaking per se. And as I said before, we're gonna leave an attachment on the the link page so that you can look at these ideas of etiquette plus other useful common questions and troubleshooting things. We try to keep the Zoom session to about an hour and a half. That seems to limit what people can comfortably take in on virtual platforms. Now, we realize that I might go a little bit long. There may be a few more questions. Then we have to reduce the, the meditation. Or if there are not as many questions or the presentation is shorter, we might have a longer meditation. But remember, the evening is not just about the discussion. It's not just about the meditation. It's not just about the joys and concerns. The virtual gathering should be taken in its totality. Be aware that the flow of the evening is important. When we get to the agent, we enter a slightly different area. And we see Chi Gi in the upper right-hand corner. And we see people sitting on chairs because during the meditation, the Shikan, most of us will be sitting on chairs. And so I wanted to specifically discuss sitting on a chair as part of the Zoom session. Now, we will start the evening 
by clearing or calming the mind and proceed after a short time to a contemplation. This will be presented either as a guided contemplation or use of a phrase, verse, or imagery. It varies according to the evening. The methods are the same as sitting meditation that we went over before. There are some important distinctions with Zoom. And the first, as I said, is the posture sitting in a chair. And I'm gonna be a little bit longer on this uh, because many people may not have sat on a chair or have never been instructed how to sit on a chair properly for the purpose of meditation. Choose a chair that's sturdy and stable and avoid one with wheels. The seat of the chair should not be contoured to your butt, but be flat and hard with a thin layer of cushioning. And this will provide optimal support and stability. The height of the seat should be adjusted so that when you lay your feet flat on the floor, your knees bend at a 90 degree angle. The height of the seat should be adjusted so that when you lay your feet flat on the floor, I, I, that's why I'm sorry, I already said that, your knees bend at a 90 degree angle. Keep in mind that the two most important factors are stability and the height of the seat. Be careful to make sure that every square inch of the bottom of the feet can make contact with the floor. If one is sitting in meditation posture on a zafu, the energy is coming up through the earth, through the perineum. If you're sitting on the, in a chair, your feet are the point at which the chi or the chi is coming through the earth to your body. And again, the chi or chi is coming down through the nasal passage, down the front of your body. It's mixing in the tantan or the hara. And then it's, it's mixing with, with the earth key, and then it's going up through the center of your body. Just keep that in mind. Remember the correct posture provides mental and physical stability. Sit with your butt in the center of the chair. Your back should be straight and not necessarily touching the back of the chair. And it depends upon the chair. Some, some backs are okay to, to be sitting on. Your feet should rest flat on the floor, parallel to one another, and about a shoulder's width apart. Likewise, your knees and your thighs are, your knees, uh, well, I'll skip this part. Your spine should be held perfectly upright without leaning in any direction or slouching. Tuck your chin in slightly so the crown of your head rises toward the ceiling and you achieve maximum vertical extension of your spine. Gently place the tip of your tongue against the roof of your mouth just behind the upper row of teeth. This folded tongue position may feel odd, but it activates stabilizing muscles in your neck and is considered to facilitate the flow of ki or energy through the body. Keep your mouth closed and don't clench your teeth. Now it's interesting because you can look at the screen if there is visual imagery being used and I'm going to start actually projecting on the screen something uh, when after we have the Shikan um, screen or look at a blank screen. The gravest, uh, I'm sorry, what to avoid on Zoom in regards to aging. The gravest error, people who are slouching, especially if you're letting your head drop down so that your chin is touching your chest. I see this online and I see it in the hondo. If you're slouching over, you're more likely to fall asleep and you're not meditating. You think you're meditating, but you're not meditating. Another is people who look around the room, glance at their phone or at other distractions. Try to get the distractions out of the place that you're sitting with the Zoom. You typically wouldn't do that in the hondo. Treat your, Zen, your Zoom session the same way. And finally, and this is really important, be mind, mindful of the other people on Zoom with you. Show them respect.
In conclusion, I'd like to conclude by repeating a few things I said at the beginning. The first is that meditation is not magic. There are different types of meditation. Shikan, the meditation that we're doing, was intended to develop character and be part of the Buddhist path. As such, it's different than the types of meditation that are used for health purposes or psychological benefit. The instruction that was given here this evening, they're not meant to be rules per se. They are methods that have been created, evolved and refined over the last 2,500 years. And we're now implying them in novel ways. Tendai Buddhist Institute Wednesday evening virtual gatherings are intended to express the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. Thus, when you are participating, you're manifesting triple jewels of Buddhism. And we're gonna open it up to questions, thoughts, and comments, and I will unmute everyone, or I will make it so that you can unmute, and then see who has some questions. Yes, Joe. Yeah, uh, this is half a question, half observation. Right? Um, beginning of the Shoshikan, it says, avoid all unwholesome actions, perform all wholesome ones, purify your will. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. But this is difficult. Um, <laughs> yes. Right, because, yes, you said we should uh, put away all the uh, distractions, including the phone. But we need to use computer in order to attend the Zoom uh, Sangha meeting. And yet I see myself so often, almost uh, unintentionally, my hand is going to my computer mouse uh, and try to look at other uh, you know, uh, <laughs> applications. And so, uh, and I think it will be more and more, it will be difficult more and more for the younger generations because they, 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 they are growing up with this internet uh, technology. And I see that my, my, my kids, I have five, they are all mm -hmm. learning remotely, but I see that they always at some point playing game online and, and they are doing that unintentionally. <laughs> so, right. so any advice, in other words, I, I see that the, Social media make, can make us impulsive and uh, very difficult to concentrate. I have, I have two words. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> but seriously, I mean, what you're, what you're mentioning is a serious problem. You know, it's one of the distractions. If we're on the computer, we're accustomed to being on there and doing other things. And as you say, it's natural to put your hand on the mouse. You know, it's just, it, it's habitual. It's something you do all the time. So I think that's why I'm, I'm suggesting that if possible, move things out of your way. And in the same way, I, I, this maybe is not quite as much of a problem as what you're describing. But for instance, if you're in the Hondo on a Wednesday night, we're having a regular gathering, or now we're on Sundays in the Hondo, there's a train that goes by and the train is loud. <laughs> Everybody hears it. I mean, you know, there are times in which I will be ready to stop the meditation, but I'll wait because I know that I don't want to speak over the, over the train, <laughs> you know? So there's always distractions. And I think that part of trying to meditate appropriately is learning to ignore those distractions, you know? And, and I, I agree, it's really difficult when you're already using a piece of technology. So anything we can do to, to eliminate those distractions is worthwhile, like putting your telephone someplace else. You know. Thank you. Uh, Maria, I think you, where did, oh, there you are, Maria, you moved. <laughs> yes, oh, you guys hand up first. You look good. Um, is, is, that, is that on the Starship Enterprise? Yeah, I'm on the Starship Enterprise today. Oh, good, good. <laughs> I'm glad to see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talk about different kinds of the, this particular type of meditation that we would do in Zoom or in the Hondo. But I was wondering if you could touch on some other ways meditation 
is available or possible, such as walking meditation or even meditating when you are doing certain things. I mean, okay. I know there's a, I know there's a little controversy about whether or not you could meditate and well, be working at something, but um, can you touch on that for me? Sure. We're, at, we're actually, I mean, this evening, you're right. I was just discussing how do we do meditation on Zoom. However, Chi Gi, uh, 1500 years ago, said that there are really four types of meditation, sitting only, walking only, both sitting and walking, and neither sitting nor walking. Now, neither sitting nor walking was the one type that you're talking about. You can be meditating while chopping onions, as an example, right. you know. Um, so there are different types of meditation, even within Shikan. When I was talking about the different types, I was talking about the difference, let's say in TM meditation, which is a specific style or insight meditation that they might do in, in Barrie, Massachusetts. But this evening, I wanted to sort of concentrate on just how do we meditate on Zoom? Because that's what we're doing these days. Although... For those who live in the area, Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock, come on down. You know, uh, we have the in-person the in-person meditations. So and that may not have, have been as complete an answer as you wanted, but I don't want to go too far outside of what we're doing tonight right now. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Jose. Well, uh, just follow up on what Job said. I think we have to come up now with the six hindrances. <laughs> uh, I, I posted your favorite. Sloth and torpor there. So we're going to have to uh, come up with a good name for the sixth hindrance. Distraction. <laughs> well, particularly uh, mouse distraction. Or mouse distraction, mouse distraction. Yeah. 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 We'll, 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 call, we'll call it um, a techno compulsion. How's that sound? Yeah. And, and we put it right <laughs> after number one, which is the whole thing about s sensory distractions. But yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? Uh, Maynard, has his name. Uh, Maynard, please. Uh, yes. Well, the Buddha recommended uh, four types of meditation, uh, sitting, standing, walking, or lying down. Uh, most teachers uh, encourage novices not to experiment with lying down because it would be the position that most promoted drowsiness. And... Uh, but I, th I think the other, the other point I was going to, but I wanted to say in my own case, uh, you know, meditation in the middle of the night, if you suffer from old age insomnia at all, uh, I'm usually up for at least two hours during the night. And uh, I've started meditating, lying down, uh, trying very hard not to make it a method of falling back to sleep. In fact, I will not fall back to sleep until the meditation period is over, usually 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And uh, if you can avoid falling asleep, because the whole point of meditation or whatever position you're in is to maintain your attention and awareness, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not a bad idea. I might even write a book on uh, meditate your way through insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to uh, add that little bit. And also to say, I find the meditation experience on Zoom not to be collective. But it's, it's, first of all, in the Hondo, you can feel other people around you. And I think that's really important, that sense that you're all meditating together. Mm -hmm. But you can't feel people on Zoom. You have to look at them. And if you're looking at them, then you're not meditating. You're distracted. Right. It's a distraction. That's and right. In my case, I've been turning off the audio, uh, the video during meditation, just not to tempt other people to look at me. I'm not wandering around pouring drinks. I'm sitting here meditating. But uh, I think it's different. There's a little bit of a, a, a person in the zoo kind of feeling on, on Zoom that I think is contrary to the spirit of meditation. I, I, I agree with you. And, and I, I think what I, when I was writing this up, it seemed to me that maybe one of the things that I should do, and I, I, by the way, I tried to give a different delivery tonight than I've given in the past. I'm, I'm trying different things as time goes on. But one of the things I realized is that you know, there's a slide that says Shikan. And then after that slide, I'm putting in a new slide that is something that you can look at if you leave it on the screen share. 
so that you're not looking at other people. In other words, turn off the people, uh, you know, the, the video of other people and just watch that screen. And I'm trying to make it such that it is neutral so that it's something that would be appropriate for, for sitting meditation. We're going to give it a shot tonight. And it, I'm even going to do it in relation to uh, the Vipassana meditation. So there's a slide to begin doing the Shamatha, and then there's going to be an addition when we do the Vipassana portion. So thank you. Thank you, Maynard. Any other questions? Sorry, Chip, Chip, did you have your hand up before? Yeah, it, it was, Maynard sort of covered it, but like <clears throat> when I'm meditating and with the video on, I, t I tend to get distracted with everybody else's me meditation. With it. And when I, when I go like this, then, then, you know, I can't be hiding. I, I can be walking out of the room and stuff like that. But I think it, it, was, it seemed to me a better way to do it than, than to tr be seeing faces. Kind of I, I agree. So what, what I would do is leave it on the screen as opposed to putting it on the, um, the videos of people during the meditation portion. We'll see how that works. Are there any other questions or comments, et cetera? Yes, Jose. Uh, yeah, I now have a question. Uh, I, I get up and, and, and leave the desk or the table and, and go. Um, I usually go sit in a different chair. Now that my knee's getting better, I'm going back to the cushion. And I see other people kind of get up and leave and then they shut their screen off. So, so what do you think of that? That if we, I mean, there, that, that's fine. And except if there's going to be a visual an imagery or visualization, yeah, that's, that's, that's then you would different. miss it. Right. Yeah. Like, Cause uh, you know, I hear the bell and I hear the Samantha right. instruction, but uh, I'm not yeah. seeing the screen. But uh, I mean, otherwise it's fine just to, you know, just to do what, what chip did and go sit in another chair or whatever it might be. Yeah. Yep. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes, Linda. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, there's um, a Japanese, I think it's a Tendai sensei that does um, meditation uh, through Facebook online. And he was saying um, to put something over the screen because he, he thinks that the computer screens are too bright for mm -hmm. doing meditation. I don't know if that's relevant, like when it's daylight out, but I know when it's like like darker when we've done this in the winter, that might be helpful um, and less right. distracting. But if you're going to have imagery on the screen, then I don't know. You'd have to have something kind of translucent that you can still see the image, but tone down the the brightness, I guess, of the, the well, screen. Yeah, Which that that's part of it. It's not going to be it's not going to be a bright image. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes, Co coaching. Um, well, it was interesting. Um, I, I, I kind of touched on something that you would you would mention to um, uh, making it so much more intentional. Uh, I like that as in term, rather than like the mindfulness word. Mm -hmm. um, but what it sounds like is is that we're we are we're talking about how how to do some of this and being able to do it for each. Or it seems like everyone's kind of sitting in different um, different environments different situations. Um, but I think what you're providing us is, is kind of the tools to which to like to look at around us and think about how to make the meditation more intentional, right? To, to spend the time making it, um, the figuring out our own how, um, which seems like a, a really nice practice in and of itself, because like Job's saying, like the, this venue is, <laughs> is not, not the most conducive, you know, mm -hmm. um, but we need, but this is what we got. And so how to make, how, how to make it the best we can. Well, I, I think in 10 years we'll have holograms and it won't be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sensei, do you have anything that you would like to add this evening before we move along? Well, <clears throat> sitting meditation is uh, sometimes very difficult, but uh, uh, we can do it uh, uh, whatever situations. Just keep your mind uh, uh, gently and uh, uh, attention to your 
what should I say, own mind. Uh, when, when you walk to walking and you, you are conscious about the walking itself. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, <clears throat> uh, we slip down and uh, because, you know, I, I just tell you my uh, own experience that uh, the other day I met a friend uh, after 30 years, he, he was the uh, same alumni of the uh, junior high school. And he said hi to me. And so, oh, you. And just I forget that uh, just uh, on my foot side, there is a kind of stopper of the car. And uh, that is about 10 centimeters height. But uh, usually I can go over such a, uh, you know, uh, things, but uh, I, I, I just uh, uh, fell down <coughs> on the street. Uh, so I thought maybe uh, my foot uh, is quite angry to me because I am now 82 years old. I supported you from the side of the, uh, my foot uh, for over uh, 80 years, but uh, you are not conscious of my foot. So be, uh, take care, you know. Uh, so mind and uh, um, body is sometimes uh, different, you know, but the uh, body and mind and everything is oneness within ourselves. So we have to take care of foods and body, everything. And uh, that is a conscious of uh, and taking care of health and taking care of yourself. That is, I think, uh, uh, very important meditation. That is my comment. Thank you, Sensei. Okay, I'm going to move us along now. So again, I'm going to mute everyone. And then we will be moving. And Sensei, if you have to leave soon, thank no, you thank for you. joining us. We'll thank see you, you soon. You. Oh, thank you. In the West, we get the impression quite often that Buddhism is an overly philosophical, intellectual religion. Many people in the 21st century and before have been informed by a Western intellectual tradition that is uncomfortable by the presence of religious faith in its devotional and ritual expression. But Rupert Gethin states that we should be careful not to mistake Buddhism's intellectual theories for Buddhism itself, just as we should not confuse learning to swim with gaining an understanding of the theory of buoyancy and propulsion. I like the distinction between reading about riding a horse and riding a horse. The two experiences are very different. I think there's a lack of understanding of, on the role of faith in Buddhism. Kanze commented, and I quote, the skeptical age dwells anyway far too much on the intellectual side of faith. Shraddha, the, verb, the word we render as faith, is etymologically akin to the Latin core, the heart. And faith is much more a matter of the heart than it is of the intellect. Kanze is making a distinction between faith as cognitive and faith as effective. Faith in the cognitive sense is an awareness that amounts to a belief in propositions or statements about which one doesn't have direct knowledge. Faith in its affective mode is a positive emotional response to someone or something one has heard or read. The Buddhist understanding of faith is almost entirely affective. In other words, the Buddhist texts understand faith in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, not so much as an intellectual understanding of certain propositions about the world, as it is a state of trust, confidence, affection, and devotion inspired by the person of the Buddha and his teachings. A confidence in the path that leads to the cessation of suffering 
which has been walked by many people before. This evening, we were adapting the Shikan methods to a relatively new means of presenting the Dharma, meditation, and worship. Zoom is a technology that can feel divorced from person-to-person -person transmission, transmission of the Dharma, which is why I attempt to find a way to express the teachings consistent with the technology, but at the same time realize that kokoro, heart, mind, spirit, are essential to walking the Buddhist path. We should not abandon the affective. Shakyamuni Buddha recommended that people should visit the four sites where he was born, gained awakening, first taught the Dharma, and died. He said that anyone who dies with a serene heart while making such a pilgrimage will gain a good rebirth. This was speaking from the heart, not a rational statement of fact. Following the Noble Eightfold Path as devotion from the heart may be more valuable than trying to rationalize our practice. That is my path. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what this storm's all about. That's Haruki Murakami. Even though we've been gathering on Zoom for over a year now, I'm still getting accustomed to it. And I'm sure many other people recognize the limitations of a virtual gathering contrasted with a personal gathering. Though, to be honest, there are maybe other people who would prefer virtual as opposed to in person. It's really a matter of personality and taste. It's good to have made new friends and see the people that we otherwise would miss through the use of this technology. And it's good to see everyone this evening. I appreciate your participation, and I hope that this evening's discussion may contribute to smoother, more effective running of our Metta Sangha. In closing, may I offer a gata. May the spirit of our ancestors light your path. May your heart be filled with love. May your mind be guided by wisdom. And may all your days be filled with meaningful effort. Svaha.